Good morning. All right, a little more. Good morning. All right, all right. I know it's tough getting up this early three days in a row, but thank you. There, there's a good morning slide. Um, first off, just a reminder to silence your cell phones. Second, I'd love to get a round of applause for our organist, Rob Fischel. I think it's safe to say that we are, are becoming known for our awesome organ music, and Rob is an essential part of that. So thank you, Rob. So as I always say, it's never too early to plan for next year. Open Source Bridge 6. June 24th through 27th. Uh, next year here in Portland. As we have done in the past, we will put some really ridiculously too cheap tickets on sale um, some starting sometime today through the next couple of days. Um, I call them loyalty tickets or, you know, early, 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 early bird tickets. Um, so keep an eye on Twitter and email for that. Never too early to start planning for 2015. <laughs> We know that we'll have an open source bridge in Portland in 2015, but we also recognize that it's not easy for everyone to get to Portland. And we also recognize that a lot of people are learning about the conference and want to come, but we want to keep our numbers nice and cozy. So, 2015, we're planning to have two open source bridges, one in another city, probably somewhere not on the west coast, maybe east coast or somewhere. And we need your help to make this happen. So, also watch Twitter and email. We're going to be sending out a link to basically an interest form where you can uh, tell us that you want Open Source Bridge to come to your city. And as we figure out a formal request for proposals process over the next couple months, we'll let you know about that and you can participate. All right. <clears throat> I'm delighted next to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Ash Dryden. Ash is an indie developer living in Madison, Wisconsin. She's been involved with the web in some form or another for the past 12 years. Ash's mission is to raise awareness about the need for diversity, inclusiveness, and empathy in open source communities and businesses. She's currently writing a book on the value proposition of increasing diversity within companies. When she isn't discussing technology or its intersection with culture, Ash is cycling, tweeting, playing board games, debating the social implications of Star Trek episodes, and waiting for her next burrito fix. That is an amazing amount to do while you're cycling. I'm impressed. <laughs> Welcome, Ash. I am on speed. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've been traveling around the country for about the past uh, six or eight months, talking to a lot of people about the lack of diversity in tech. Um, we, a lot of people recognize that this is a problem. I think that this conference recognizes it a lot more than most other c c conferences and communities do. Um, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. So as Christy mentioned, my name is Ash. I'm Ash Dryden pretty much everywhere online. A lot of the resources and things I'm talking about today uh, you can find on my website um, and feel free. I don't think I'll have uh, time for questions today, but if you want to grab me afterwards or ask me on Twitter, that's perfectly cool. So what is diversity? Uh, I think it's really important to uh, remember that diversity is more than gender. A lot of times when we're talking about diversity in tech, a lot of people bring up the where are the women uh, question. and and that is part of the problem, um, but it's more than women. It's also, uh, gender is more than just men and women, so it's important to keep that stuff in mind. Um, and it also covers various backgrounds, experiences, and lifestyles. And really important to mention, it's not always visible. So what makes us different from each other is not always something you can see on the outside. Uh, this covers things like um, disabilities, physical and mental health, economic class, education, um, and a lot more things. Um, this is just some of the, the more common and larger, larger marginalized groups, um, but there are so many more than this, and it's, it's important to kind of recognize the differences between us and, and celebrate them and also take into consideration those kinds of things when we're trying to reach out to people in our communities. So uh, intersectionality, just I have a few uh, vocab terms to throw out uh, just so we can kind of get on the same baseline so we have the same vocabulary and understand uh, when we're talking about these kinds of issues. Intersectionality is uh, the way that all of these traits about a person, their age, uh, their gender, their race, um, how they all contribute to the, the, the inequality that they experience in their everyday lives. So when we're talking about those bubbles from before, this is where all of those things meet. Uh, the way that a, a white woman is treated is very different than a woman of color or uh, a woman with disabilities. Um, so 
just uh, as an example, in the United States, um, women earn on average 80.9% of what men do. And unfortunately, this number has actually gone down in the past five years. Uh, so it used to be about 83%, now it's 80.9. And this is controlling for all other factors, including education, um, time in and away from the industry. Um, and so that's a really sad number, but this is a little bit worse. Latina women earn 59.3% of what white men do. So we can kind of get, get an idea of what you know, that pancaking effect of the different traits of a person have on the quality of their lives. Additionally, the unemployment rate in the United States, depending on who you ask and who you trust, is about 7.5%. Um, but the unemployment rate for the blind community is 70 to 75%. So the next vocab term is privilege. I'm sure many of you have heard the term privilege before, but privilege is basically an unearned advantage that somebody gets uh, for per perceived trait that they have, um, putting them in the normal or default group. Um, additionally, uh, that comes with a lot of basically bonuses. So you get things like uh, better education, access to tech at an earlier age, um, you generally have a higher pay, people assume uh, that you're competent, you don't have to prove your competency, um, the quality of social and professional networks that you have, um, because we tend to be born into a class and die in the same class, um, our parents will be in the same class as us, and so if we're born in an upper class, um, our parents have uh, much better access to um, things like funding for startups or um, to help us get into higher quality educational institutions. Also, we're seen as a skill set instead of traits. So this is the difference between being a geek and being a geek girl. Having, having, to, having to differentiate someone because they're outside of the default group. And uh, also being e uh, having an easier time fitting into or identifying with the subculture. So one of the issues that we're facing in the open source community and technology in general is that many people are kind of turned away from the community and the field as a career because it's a very, it seems it's seen as a, a subculture. So geeks can be described as people who are into video games, into board games, they tend to be socially awkward. All of these things are stereotypes and are probably not true about all of us, but this is what the majority of the population believes programmers, geeks, people who contribute to open source, people who work on computers at all, what they're like. Um, so stereotype threat, I believe that this was talked about in the imposter syndrome um, talk, um, but this is basically an anxiety or concern a person has about confirming a negative stereotype about the group that they belong to. Uh, I'm sure that many people have seen this comic before. Um, so on the right, you have, uh, wow, you suck at math, and on the left, you have the opposite way, uh, and wow, girls suck at math. So it's the difference between um, actually representing that stereotype and that fear, and it's actually been proven that when you prompt someone by telling them, wow, girls suck at math, girls will actually do worse at math. Uh, when you aren't prompting them with that information, they do just as well, if not better. So imposter syndrome, we talked about a couple days ago. Um, <clears throat> these are basically people who are unable to internalize their accomplishments. This isn't something that only affects uh, people who are in marginalized groups. Uh, it affects everyone, uh, but it's especially pronounced in people who um, belong to marginalized groups that maybe don't identify with the majority default group. Um, it's especially pronounced um, anywhere that there are negative stereotypes. Um, these people are less likely to apply for certain jobs, especially in groups where competency has to be proven. Uh, this is especially the case for our industry when we're talking about going into an interview and whiteboarding. Um, a lot of times people will challenge certain people more than others because of the traits that they represent. Uh, they're also less likely to submit a talk to a conference. Um, you'll hear things like, I don't know enough, I'm not an expert. Um, this conference has actually done better than almost any conference I've ever been to about the gender balance, so I'm really appreciative of that. Um, they're also less likely to attend a conference because they don't see people like them that are represented, they don't know that they'll fit in. So I spoke a couple times about marginalization. Uh, marginalization is somebody who's pushed to the edge of a group uh, and accorded less importance and their needs and desires are being ignored. Uh, unfortunately, society teaches us to do this to, do this to everyone, uh, even uh, within marginalized groups. Um, and a lot of times, like, I'll bring up these issues in the tech space and I'll hear things like this. I'm different, I'm logical and rational, I don't see gender and race. I heard someone groan. <laughs> I, and I get this all the time. I even get this from people who fall within these marginalized groups. Um, and the important thing to remember is we're not the only group that thinks that way. Scientists and STEM professors thought this and they do it to other scientists and STEM professors. 
There's this experiment that went on at either Yale or Harvard, I don't remember which, um, where they gave uh, a bunch of professors two different resumes. They were exactly the same. The only difference was the name on the resume. One was John, one was Jennifer. Only difference. Uh, they asked the people to, uh, to rate each resume on a scale of one to seven, how likely you would be to hire them, how much you would like to work with them. Um, for John's resume, they gave him a four. For Jennifer's, they gave her a 3.3. Again, exact same resume, nothing different except the name. Um, they also paid Jennifer 87% of what they paid John. The only difference was the name. So these are people who we, we kind of epitomize as being logical and rational that are doing this to each other. And it's important to remember that even marginalized people do this to people within their same social group. For, so for that experiment, there were women who did that to other women who, who said that Jennifer should earn less money, who, they would be less likely to work with her, they would enjoy working with her less. So how diverse is the tech industry? Uh, well, women make up about 24%, um, but only 1.5 to 3% of open source contributors are women. This is especially a problem when we consider the number of jobs that are asking to see open source contributions before somebody can even apply. And uh, I have mentioned a lot about women today, and unfortunately that's just because a lot of the statistics and data that's available focuses specifically on male, female, gender, and that's where a lot of the funding is. So kind of excuse uh, not having way more examples in here. Um, but if we look at the tech industry as, uh, as a whole versus the US population, the dark gray bar being our industry and the light gray bar being the US population, we can see that some things are kind of off. Um, women are pretty underrepresented, underrepresented um, but what's more concerning is uh, Hispanic and black individuals in our community. Uh, Hispanic and Latino people actually are less than half as likely than other people to be in the industry. And we need to talk about why that's a problem. We need to start discussing why this is a problem. So the lack of diversity isn't just in the United States, it's actually a global problem. If we look at countries like India, about 8% of their CS graduates are women. The United States is doing a little bit better at 17. The UK has 18.2. France has 20. Brazil has 20. South Africa has 25. So you can see like this is, this is not something that's just us. Something is going wrong on a global scale. And I'll, I'll bring up these statistics to people and people will say things like this. Maybe women just aren't interested in programming. Or maybe they're not biologically predisposed to be programmers. Which is, which is really interesting considering uh, a woman wrote the first compiler in the first programming language, but I digress. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's really important to remember that science has actually proven that there's no physical or biological difference between men and women, between any races, about um, how well they'll do at programming. Absolutely no difference. The good part about this is that that means it's a purely social and cultural construct. That means we can change it. So that's actually uh, really promising to me that this is something we can fix. And one of the statistics I left out in the lump that I gave you before was Bulgaria, which has 73% of their CS graduates are women. So what is, what is Bulgaria doing better than the United States? How is Bulgaria doing this so much better than the United States? We need to take the time to examine these things and, and figure this out and understand why through our entire culture, we're kind of raising certain people to believe that sciences aren't for them, or um, that certain people are constantly being reminded that you're different, and you don't belong here, and you're not as good as the rest of us because of cer a certain trait that you happen to be born with. <clears throat> so diversity matters, and it's important to understand why it matters. Um, di diversity matters a lot to businesses. Um, when we're looking at things like sales revenue, number of customers, market share, profits relative to competitors, all of that increases as racial and gender workforce diversity increases. Diverse teams are able to solve com complex problems better and faster. Uh, they're more creative and teams are stimulated through persistent exposure to minority perspectives. So you're constantly doing more, you're being more innovative, you're making better decisions. This is really important when we're looking at an industry that is basically their job is to innovate. The most innovation that can happen in the world is in the sciences. So we need more diverse teams to be making better decisions, to be creating better outcomes for the world. So if we understand that, and we understand that the financial success and viability of a company is directly related to the makeup of its teams, why aren't we talking about diversity more? Why aren't we hiring for diversity? Diversity also matters to society. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, we have a, a problem actually worldwide where the majority of people are born into a class and they die in the same class. They're born into the same class as their parents are. It's very difficult to get out of. So 
In our industry, we're very lucky that we're paid very well. Uh, actually, in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math, even if you have a degree in STEM and you aren't working in STEM, you will make more money than people outside of it, hands down. So having a STEM degree goes so much further and does so much more for you. And this will create class mobility. So we have more people that are escaping poverty. And in the United States, this is becoming a greater and greater problem. The poverty line in the United States is, I want to say, $12,000, which I found out the other day is the same amount of money it takes per year to um, own and operate an SUV, which is really sad. How many people own SUVs? Yeah, no one wants to raise their hand. They're like, mm. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Um, so as I mentioned before, the wage gap is smaller in STEM fields. I mentioned before that women earn 80.3% of what men do in the general population. In tech, it's 87%. So that 6.3% actually is a very large number. So why do we have a lack of diversity? There are a handful of problems, and I, I have a lot of people who come to me and ask, like, what is the one thing we can do to solve this problem? <laughs> and it's such a huge problem. Like, it's, it's so difficult to just give one thing. Um, so let's take a look at the three major segments, the first one being pipeline. These are the people that are coming into the industry um, through education um, and through, like, traditional learning. Um, a lot of people have these cultural cues about um, what, is for, what is for men, what is for women, what is for white people, what is for people of color. Um, and we start this really early. We start this in toys for children. And think about how early children get toys that are, tend to be gendered. We don't have famous role models to represent them. Uh, this, is, this is people like Steve Jobs, like Mark Zuckerberg. These are white dudes. Uh, this is what the vast majority of industry looks up to. Uh, there aren't... Uh, people of color at these, this, these high levels. There aren't women at these high levels unless they're the exception and not the rule. So we have people like Sheryl Sandberg, who a lot of people look up to, I understand, but she is very much the exception and not the rule. Um, having access to technology, um, on average, men get access to their first computers at 11 and women at 14. So think about the difference that three years can make while you're going through puberty, right? <laughs> Um, African American and Hispanic households have lower computer ownership rates and broadband adoption, uh, but the cool thing is they're also adopting smartphones at a much higher rate than any other segment of the population. The downside is, think about whatever web app you are running, what is the mobile experience like? Is it super diminished from what the desktop version is? Imagine having to go through and, and enjoy the internet from only the mobile view of every single site that you visit. Also, access to quality education. Um, the greatest uh, indicator of earning potential is a high school education. So we have a lot of debates, especially in the United States, about you know, what, what we should be putting money towards when it comes to education. Um, and we have so many schools in poverty. We have a lot of schools that are shutting down. Kids are being bused to other locations, maybe hours away. Schools in neighborhoods that have, uh, schools in poor neighborhoods have lower quality math and science programs. There's a 25 difference between the readiness of African American and Hispanic students uh, as compared to white students when it comes to things like science and math. So if you're getting into college, if you're lucky enough to get into college and be able to afford college, you're 25% you're behind all of your white counterparts. Having access to health care, uh, women are much more likely to be caregivers. This is of children and adult dependents. So they're much less likely to take risks where it involves losing their health insurance, moving across the country. Um, they also have less access to quality health care. And this goes for people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ people. Uh, outside of, like, say, California, I think Oregon is pretty good about this, too. Um, but very few states uh, cover trans anything. Very few, very few states, and this is going to change, of course, in a couple years, but very few states right now um, make it easy for people who have chronic illnesses to move between jobs and keep their health insurance and not lose their medications. Imagine if you switched a job and lost your health insurance or, unfortunately, just lost your job and lost your health insurance, and you needed, say, seizure medicine to be able to get through the day. Some people with seizures actually have it so bad that they could die if they have a seizure. So losing your job and losing your health care could actually mean death to a lot of people. And this is something that we need to keep in mind when we're looking at the policies that we're making at, at our jobs and workplaces. So the second big, big, big area is attraction. Uh, like I mentioned before, we have a lack of role models. Um, we're less likely to see people that represent uh, us in companies and conferences. Um, people outside of the groups are less likely to understand the struggles that the people within that group face. 
So I'll have people ask me a lot, like, what is it like to be a woman in technology? What is it like to be a queer person in technology? Because they don't know, and I appreciate them asking, but there are a lot of people who don't ask and assume the kinds of things that we need. Also, the geek stereotype. I mentioned this before. Uh, there was a study that was done uh, with women in college, and they um, exposed them to a person who met the geek stereotype. So these are women who are in a CS program, and they said, we're going to bring in somebody to talk to the class. This is somebody who met the geek stereotype, who was socially awkward. They were a little bit quiet. Um, they were a little unsure of their words. <clears throat> and they were actually so turned off that 70% of them decided not to continue their education in computer science. So it's important to remember, too, that like, it, it's, it's unfortunate that many of us do meet that geek stereotype. And there's nothing that we can do about that. That's who we are. Nobody is asking that to change. But there are a lot of things that affect what makes people want to be in our industry. Um, and what that like, uh, belonging and the sense of you know, being in a group that you feel like you identify with, uh, how far that really goes. We need to have more role models. And in this study, this was even true of women who met this stereotype. So if it was a class full of women and they brought in a woman who met this stereotype, they were still less likely to continue that education. So that was irrelevant. And the third area, and the one that I focus on most, is attrition. Attrition is people actually leaving. <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty sweet. They don't go that far. <laughs> I am done. You know, this happened to me last time, too. Where did my thing go? Oh, that's... Tell me when I get close, OK? Ah. All right, so attrition is people leaving the industry. <laughs> All right, so 56% of women leave tech within 10 years. This is twice the rate of men, and only 20% of them are leaving due to children. So what is happening that so many women are leaving the industry? Unfortunately, this is higher than the number of women that are entering the industry. So you can see how this is a problem. We also have fewer and fewer women that are going after computer science degrees. Uh, the percentage of women that are going after computer science degrees in the United States falls by about 3% every four years. Um, and that's unfortunate. Like I mentioned before, the computer science industry as a whole used to be dominated by women. So it's getting worse and worse. Um, so some of the issues that face women or people of color or LGBTQ people and why they're leaving include things like harassment. Um, people in marginalized groups are twice as likely to report being harassed or mistreated. <clears throat> there was a study that was done asking uh, women and men, uh, have they seen or experienced harassment? And women were twice as likely to report, and men were half as likely to have even noticed that it happened at all. So I, you'll hear a lot of people say things like this. I've never seen someone get harassed, so it, doesn't, it must not happen. Like, it, it doesn't happen at my conference. You know, our, our company is really good. This doesn't happen where I work. Um, and when you tell this to somebody who's experienced harassment, this is erasure. This is uh, negating their experience. And especially if you're the only person, or that person is the only person in a marginalized group in your company, that basically says, like, they don't care. Nothing is going to happen with this. This problem is going to continue, and they'll leave. Uh, discrimination is a next big section. Um, like I mentioned before, um, pay is a really big problem, but also things like advancement and job offers. Um, in Silicon Valley, men are 2.7 times more likely to be promoted to high-ranking jobs such as vice president or senior management. And this is um, considering the fact that men and women are equally likely to hold mid-level jobs. So it's happening that they're stopping at that point, and no one's promoting them from there. So, that was a lot of problems. That was a small slice of the pie of the problems. So let's talk about the kinds of things that we can solve. So the important thing is change starts with us. I, I really believe that because this conference is so great about things like diversity and inclusion, that uh, a lot of the people here are already thinking about these things. I've, I've been in a lot of discussions uh, over the past couple days uh, with people that are thinking about these kinds of issues and working hard to fix them. Um, and this is my favorite thing ever. Education is the Trojan <laughs> horse to empathy. So <clears throat> educating people nearby, because they are unlikely to find this information on their own, to seek it out, especially if it's something that doesn't affect them, uh, makes them more likely to uh, empathize with the cause, makes them more likely to understand uh, why this is a problem and how we can solve it. 
The vast majority of people, I really believe, do want to see this problem solved and don't want to see people get hurt or leave the industry. Uh, they just don't know how to help or they don't understand how major of a problem it is. Uh, we need to get to know people that are different than us. This is an excellent conference to do that at. There is a very diverse audience here. There are quite a few people uh, that you probably don't come into contact with on a regular basis. Out of curiosity, how many people work at a company where everyone on the DevOps, DevOps team or programming team are all white men? All right, perfect. So you have a job now. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have to also have to understand that uh, bias and discrimination are often subtle. These are, these are called microaggressions. So this is something like going into a, a conference call and it's all men and one woman and asking the woman to be the one to take notes. Um, that's something that's a small dig that you don't really see, but that's probably the 10th time that that's happened to her. I talk a lot at conferences and I'll stand up on stage and it'll, especially at um, single track conferences, I'll stand up on stage and say, I'm a developer, I've been a developer for 12 years, I really love what I do, I'm really passionate about what I do. And at the after party, people will ask me if I'm a project manager. Is there anything wrong with being a project manager? Of course not, but their assumption is being made based on where the majority of women in the industry are. So did they mean that as an insult to me? No, of course not. They were just trying to start conversation and trying to get an idea of what I did, but they don't understand that that might be the fifth time that someone's asked me that tonight. Learning to apologize. Um, this is probably my, my favorite recipe ever. Has anybody seen the ice cube recipe online? How to make ice cubes? Sweet, awesome, so you should Google it after this. But there's a, uh, a recipe on the Food Network for how to make ice cubes, and it's very easy. One, get an ice cube tray. Two, fill it with water. Three, stick it in the freezer. Super easy, makes sense, right? S apologizing is the exact same way. So three steps. Um, one, what I did was wrong. So recognizing that you actually did something wrong. Uh, the second is, I'm sorry. Nothing more than that, Don't, do not say but. If you start saying but, then stop. Apologize again and start over, because that's not an apology. And the third is uh, <clears throat> making up for what you did by trying your best not to do it again. And I give you this recipe because you're going to screw up. A lot of people are really afraid of offending somebody, are really afraid of doing somebody, something that's gonna hurt someone's feelings or make a situation really uncomfortable for someone. But we all do it. This is unfortunately how a lot of people learn. I make mistakes all the time and people call me out on it and I appreciate that they, they call me out on it even if like, my face gets red and I feel really guilty and I feel really bad. But I'll learn and I'll, I'll try my best to not do it again. We also need to be advocating for change. A lot of us have a lot of privilege in the tech industry, and that means that people are more likely to listen to us, and we're more likely to be given a stage to speak. So we need to be speaking out for people that aren't like us, for people that don't have the privilege to be standing up in large spaces like this, and be educating people about why this is a problem or how we can start to change it. We need to talk about these issues openly. Uh, I, I pretty much do all of my work anymore in the Ruby, in the Ruby programming community. Um, but I actually came from PHP, and when I left PHP, a lot of people said to me, um, why are you in the Ruby community? I thought that they were really sexist. Like, don't you hate that? Like, I see something happen all the time about them being really sexist. And they'll say, that never happens in the PHP, P PHP community. We're so friendly, we're so nice. And I'd be like, well, I was in the PHP community for nine years, and all of the issues that I can report came from the PHP community. So uh, the nice thing about the Ruby community is that we talk about these things openly. So it seems like a lot of drama, and it seems like a lot of Twitter wars. I mean, there's actually a website called Ruby Drama that's like, what is the latest drama with Ruby? Um, <laughs> but we talk about these things because we understand it's a problem and we want it to get better. If we don't talk about them, it'll never get better. Uh, so when you notice these kinds of things, uh, there's one really simple sentence, and I use this on Twitter. This, I should probably create a macro for this because I use it so often. It's just, that's not cool, frowny face. And the, for, the, for the vast majority of people, this actually works because it actually like, makes them stop and think. Um, and if it doesn't work on people, those tend to be the people that aren't going to change anyway. So I just kind of like let them do their thing and flame out on the, on the side. Um, and remember that just because someone is a brilliant programmer on your team or in the community doesn't mean that they're immune from being a jerk. Doesn't mean that they should get away with being a jerk. If anything, they should be role models for everyone else in the community, everyone else in your company. Call those people out, do not let them get away with that. Uh, we also have to influence change in our communities. Talk to more people about these things, um, help conferences start codes of conduct, 
Um, do your best to include people when you go to meetups. If you see somebody that's new that walks in the door and they're looking really scared and completely alone, go and talk to them. Have the hard conversations. This is a really hard one. I know a lot of people that will say, you know, I see that happen and I just, like, that's a conversation I can't have. But remember that you are more than likely not at the end of whatever that situation is. And the person who is feels like no one is sticking up for me, no one is standing up for me, no one cares that this is happening. I've had incidents happen to me at conferences where I'm surrounded by male friends and someone will say something so inappropriate and I'll have this look of shock on my face because how can humans do these, these kinds of things to each other? And all of the guys will be like, well, I should go and get some beer. I'll be back in a little bit. Like, that doesn't help me. I feel like now everybody else that was standing around me doesn't care and is allowing this to happen. We need to start increasing education and access. Um, we can, we're very lucky that the vast majority of people who are maybe in this room don't have a formal education that got them, that got them to the job where they are today. So we can help facilitate uh, events for marginalized people in tech. There are a lot of great uh, groups all over the world, things like Black Girls Code, uh, Latino Startups, Black Entrepreneurs, Girl Develop It, Rails Girls, um, Pi Ladies. Support these, support them financially, support them by giving them space, support them by, um, thanks, support them by, um, by uh, going and being a mentor, being a TA. Volunteer at local schools and groups. Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs are always looking for people to come and teach and talk to these kids. Um, we should focus on groups that don't normally have access. Don't waste your time going to rich kids' schools. They have computers, they have internet access, they have the money that they need. Uh, commit financial resources. Are you donating money to your alma mater, to your Ivy League? They probably don't need the money. If you still feel like you need to financially support them, maybe split that donation in half and give the other half to a technical college, to a historical black college, to a women's college. They need it far more. Uh, work with colleges and universities to start changing the curriculum so it's more up to date. Um, tell them that you're a business that's hiring people and you want to be able to hire some of their graduates. This is something that colleges really focus on and they pump these numbers out to students or to potential students and say, you know, we have a 97% higher rate upon graduating. You want to make sure that the university in your area is preparing the students to be able to work in a business like yours. Ask them why they're not teaching their students version control. Ask them why they're not talking to their students about open source. Um, ask them specifically, what are you doing to help students who have had less exposure to technology? Um, there was, let's see, we can do that by removing bias from schools and universities. And like I said, a lot of this is subtle. A lot of them don't realize that this is a problem. Um, Harvey Mudd is a college that has done very well with this. Uh, they doubled the number of female CS grads by asking one question, have you programmed before? If they have programmed before, then they, they separated them out into a separate room, and then they taught the students who hadn't programmed before separately, and it was a very unintimidating atmosphere, and they were much more likely to succeed because they didn't feel like, I'm so far behind, I don't know anything about computers, I'm never going to catch up, I'm stupid, so there's a lot we can do that's super subtle to change these problems. We can change our workplaces. Think about what the about page of your website looks like. This is the first thing I ask every business that I talk to. Is it all white dudes? More than likely, yes. There's an awesome Tumblr called 100% Men that uh, basically takes screenshots of businesses' websites and goes through and it's all white dudes, white dudes, white dudes. And these are very large companies that are known very well in our industry. Ask them why that continues to be a problem. Uh, vocally support people in your community. Be active in the community, create diversity statements um, and initiatives and follow them through. Don't just create them and run away. Attend events and job fairs for marginalized communities. Go to historic black college job fairs. Go to women's college job fairs. Do not only go to Ivy League job fairs. Um, change the language in your job listings and in your requirements. If you don't actually require a CS degree and you just have it in there, take that out. Like I said before, 17% of CS graduates right now are women. If you're requiring that they also have open source contributions, that person basically doesn't exist. So if you are hoping to hire more women, good luck. Like, that's not gonna happen. Um, know what your benefits are for your company and make sure that they're appropriate for people that are more than young white men. Um, Find out what the same-sex partner benefits are at your company. Know what the maternity leave policy is for men and women and people of all genders. 
Um, make sure that you have trans-inclusive healthcare, or at least have, uh, have an answer available for when someone asks. We're working on this. Thank you for asking about it. This is something that you know, we, we really want to do. We want to be more inclusive. Uh, if you have things like flex time, this is great for people who have medical appointments, who have dependent care, people who have anxiety, who would rather work at home. Um, change the way that you're doing interviewing. If you do not have to code on a whiteboard for your job, please do not ask this of your job applicants. Make sure that people are being paid equally. You're, if you have an HR department, they should be checking this regularly. Make sure that people's job, uh, job um, listings match up with what they actually do and that they're being paid commensurately. Make sure your culture isn't messed up. I talked to somebody yesterday who was talking about how um, they have all white guys on their programming stuff and they're trying to change that. And what can we do to reach out to more people? And I said, well, what is your culture like? Because the worst thing would be to find somebody who's really capable and brilliant and bring them in and for them to realize that the people that they're going to work for or work with are homophobic. That, that's just terrible. Like, especially if you're moving across the country, you're uprooting your entire life. So fix your culture first. Uh, start mentoring uh, and do career goal attainment as soon as people start working for you. Ask them, where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? What, do you want to learn DevOps? We will get you someone who is in DevOps to train you because that's something that you're interested in. So we've covered a lot of things. There is no silver bullet to any of these like I mentioned before. There's a lot of problems. There are a lot of different solutions. Work on what you can, affect what you can, and remember that all of us have to participate in this for this to change. It can't only be the people that are in these marginalized groups. And I don't have time for questions, but thank you. <laughs> Oh, I, yes, thank you. Uh, actually, I do have time for questions. Does anybody have any? Um, do I have suggestions for whiteboard coding interviews? Yes. Alternatives, alternatives I'm sorry. Uh, alternatives. Uh, yes, pair programming. Uh, have people actually work on what they would be working on as if it were their jobs. Um, go in to GitHub or whatever you use for your issue tracking. Have them pick out what they want to work on and pair with them. You know, have them talk you through the problems so you can understand their thought processes um, and have them actually work on things. Etherpad over the phone. Etherpad over the phone. Etherpad's not super accessible um, for screen readers and that kind of thing. Otherwise, I would say that that would work. Yes. Cool, so the suggestion was uh, having a problem that you have all of your candidates work on over email. Uh, you do a double blind, so you remove their uh, name and any other identifying uh, information, and then you evaluate that code, and that's how you kind of proceed further with the interview or with the right. process. The so you shouldn't know anything about the person whose code you're reviewing, basically. Well, anyway, the question was, <laughs> 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 um, the question was, uh, the assumption that men tend to more likely be sociopaths and it's kind of required to be a sociopath to be at a high level of a company or an organization, uh, how do we get more women to be sociopaths? <laughs> um, um, <laughs> how do you counteract that? So, sure, sure. So, um, so make, make sure that you're spending time with all members of your team, making sure that you're hiring uh, junior developers, you're you know, hiring and paying, please pay internships and apprenticeships, that kind of thing. Like I said, put them on a, a career path so they know where they want to go, um, getting people involved more in open source, especially at higher levels. Um, I came from the Drupal community, and um, one of the core committers for the past few years is a woman named Angie Byron, a lesbian woman named Angie Byron. And uh, she started out as a Google Summer of Code uh, student who you know, basically ground floor of the community and within five years all the way up to the top. So there are ways to do it, um, just making sure that you're paying attention to everyone at the same, right? One more, one more, no, no more. You can come up and uh, talk to me afterwards or talk to me on Twitter, totally open to talk about this stuff, but uh, thank you.